This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Tonight, an intriguing look at a little-known phenomenon, the mysterious link between adoptees and their birth families. Many believe that even after years of separation, they are connected by a remarkable psychic tie that cannot be explained by coincidence or science. In Rhode Island, a wild car chase ended in the stabbing death of 20-year-old Jason Bass. His attacker, Adam Emery, was convicted of murder and then released on bail pending sentencing. Hours later, Emery's car was found abandoned on the Newport Bridge, leading many to believe that Emery and his wife had jumped to their deaths. But reliable sources believe that Adam Emery may still be alive. When 38-year-old Latricia White was murdered, the police and her family began to suspect her boyfriend, Doug Walker Hunt, who had mysteriously dropped from sight. More than a year later, he is still missing. But is Dub a cold-blooded killer? Or was he a victim of violence himself? Join me for these intriguing new cases and much more. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. A joyous reunion between a mother and her long-lost daughter. Brothers and sisters who grew up apart meet for the first time as adults. Remarkable moments like these have been captured by our cameras dozens of times. Imagine meeting your child or a sibling, in reality a complete stranger after years of wondering what he or she is like. We have learned that in many cases, reunited family members have a surprising amount in common more than can be explained by genetics or simple coincidence. We decided to take a closer look at this mysterious connection, this bond that seemed to defy scientific explanation. Don Larkin grew up knowing he had been adopted, but he was 44 years old before he finally located his birth mother, Betty Landers. Even before Don met Betty, he knew they would have much in common. As he approached her house for the first time, Don noticed an unusual display of knickknacks hanging in the window, a carved hummingbird, and next to it, a crystal prism. Don had only seen these items together in one other place, his own front window. It really startled me to see somebody else having something like that in the window of their house. And I just thought, well, she must be a pretty neat lady, because pick the same stuff I did. <laughs> Coincidences that are very rare, such as Betty and Don's both having hummingbirds and crystals in their front windows of their houses, are almost impossible to explain by the traditional cause-effect genetic relationship. That's a very good example of one that is probably due to some unknown spiritual, psychic uh, connection. Many believe that the same eerie bond exists between separated siblings. Lorelai Smith, who everyone called Lori, was the only daughter of her adoptive parents. Yet even as a four-year-old, she sensed that somewhere she had a sister. Yeah, we have a sister. But you don't have a sister. Yes, I do. I was so firm about it, one of the teachers felt necessary to contact my parents. But I still don't think you I was told at the time not to continue with this illusion or fantasy, but I apparently still kept 
insisting I had a sister. At that time in 1959, Lorelei did indeed have a sister, Lori, then one and a half years old, and we were living in Alaska. Lorelei was in New Mexico. As children, Lori Smith and her sister, Lori Stifler, had much more in common than just their first names. Both owned horses and both played the same musical instruments, the flute and the guitar. Surprisingly, they had each learned sign language, though neither one knew a single deaf person. I believe that the most common explanation for these coincidences is probably genetic. But there are coincidences that the genetic attachment, the genetic cause, simply can't explain. And then I think we have to look to a spiritual, a telepathic, a psychokinetic type of explanation, difficult as that may be to do. Elizabeth Bersonetti's story is a case in point. She grew up with her adoptive family in Southern California. For as long as she can remember, Elizabeth was drawn to anything and everything French. Library. In I always had a fascination with languages, and the first one I wanted to speak was French. You are so good. You I was just obsessed with the language. It was so foreign to me, and I just, I wanted to be different. I wanted to be those people that I saw in the films, the Parisians walking along, the, the students studying at the Sorbonne. I wanted that identity. I wanted to be French. In 1985, Elizabeth formally requested a reunion with her birth mother through the agency that had handled her adoption. However, both Elizabeth's birth mother and adoptive mother were required to give their consent. Afraid to hurt her adoptive mother's feelings, Elizabeth postponed the search. Five years passed. In January of 1990, Elizabeth married a young man she met while traveling in Italy. Elizabeth says that one month later, she began to have a series of recurring dreams. A shadowy woman always appeared, and Elizabeth soon came to believe the woman was her birth mother. My mother was being told that she didn't have very long to live, that she had cancer, and that it was going to progress at a very rapid rate. You can't give up hope. There was a lot of sadness I felt from the dream. She was obviously very gravely ill. And to me, that said that she was dying. When Elizabeth woke up, she was really upset about it. And, you know, of course, I said, you know, it's impossible, just over worried about it. You have to worry it, and, you know, it's, it's not going to be anything. But then she had the same dream again and in the following days, and she actually once woke up crying about it. In late August, I woke up with the, almost the fact that my mother was dead. I was never going to meet her. It was over. I was never going to see her. I was too late. It, it, it was on me that whole, the whole day and all the days after that that I had missed her. Soon after that disturbing dream, Elizabeth returned to the adoption agency. This time, she had her adoptive mother's signed consent in hand. I guess all the waivers are in. All the waivers are in? You mean you have my birth mothers as well? Oh, yes, um, since May of 85. So I Elizabeth was stunned by the timing. Her birth mother had asked for a reunion just days after Elizabeth's own initial request. Nicole Roland, and she's French-Canadian. Bonjour. Uh, I'm looking for Nicole Roland, please. Who is this? Um, I'm an old friend of hers from Los Angeles. Oh, I'm afraid I have bad news for you. Nicole has passed away. When? Last August. It was devastating. And I said, did she die on August 28th? And she said, yes. And she just broke into tears and said, how would you know that? All I could think of was that my dreams were true, that I, I, I had had this strange connection to her. I had known when she was sick, and I had known when she died. 
Incredibly, Nicole Roland had lived the life Elizabeth once dreamed of for herself. Nicole had been a professor of French, spending two years among the Parisians, studying at the Sorbonne. It seems that me and my birth mother had a lot in common and would have had a lot in common had we been able to know each other. It appears that we were living at times a parallel life, doing the same things, being in the same places, and interested in the same subjects. Although Elizabeth was never able to meet Nicole, she did discover a whole new family. Elizabeth flew to Canada to meet her half-sister Sophie and a house full of Nicole's friends and relatives. During the visit, Elizabeth continued to find unexplainable links to her birth mother. Hi. Hi. Can I draw with you? Sure. Okay. What should I draw? I don't know, maybe a house. Okay, let's make it turquoise. I went to all the crayons and I selected a turquoise crayon, which was sort of odd, I thought, but I just, it was an unconscious thing. And I started drawing this house. And I'd never drawn a house like this in my life. It was, the door was on the wrong side, the garage was, was on the wrong side of the door and it had little weird dormers and turquoise trim. And um, I just remarked, even while I was drawing, well, this is a strange house and, well, it's a house, here it is. John, look at this. The room got very quiet. Everybody seemed to be staring at me and I felt very uncomfortable. Here, Elizabeth. Yeah. Why did you draw this house? I don't know. Really? You don't know? No. How is it? Nice. The day after I did the drawing, my sister took me to the house that she lived in with my mother, and it was the house that I had drawn the previous night. The same little odd house with the peaked roof and the turquoise trim and the garage on the wrong side. Elizabeth says that just before leaving Canada, one final extraordinary incident reaffirmed the almost magical connection with her birth mother. She would be so proud. Oh, Lucie, thank you. A friend of Nicole's gave Elizabeth one of Nicole's most treasured books, a collection of poems by a German writer. It was your mother's favorite book. As it happened, the author was also one of Elizabeth's favorites. In fact, she had brought the same book with her to Canada. Thank you so much. Merci. I would like to believe that she was consciously communicating with me, but I don't really have any way of knowing. I can, whatever it is, I think that it's powerful and that it's, uh, it's, it's certainly alternately wonderful and frightening sometimes. When we begin to look at the connections that seem to occur across both time and space, we run into the inability of our current knowledge system to explain things like this, but they happen so frequently that there must be some reality behind them. And maybe I am looking for a connection to her that's deeper and more rooted than it might have been, but I tend to think that what I feel is very true she couldn't give me the legacy of knowing her or, or of having shared things with me. So she shared things with me in another way. Next, the bizarre saga of Adam Emery. Did the convicted murderer commit suicide by jumping from Rhode Island's Newport Bridge? Or did he cleverly stage his own death? The Newport Bridge arcs some two miles across the Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island. At its highest point, the roadbed stands 219 feet above the water. On the evening of November 10, 1993, the bridge was a scene of a sobering discovery, the latest twist in one of the state's most sensational murder cases. Shortly before 7 p.m., a bridge supervisor and a state trooper investigated an empty car that was blocking one of the westbound lanes. The engine was running, and the headlights were on. What do you got? Abandoned car. Nobody in it. Nobody around. Why don't you 
check the sides. All right, I'll check over there. On the back seat were several articles of clothing neatly folded. Up front, cash, cut up credit cards, and a driver's license. When I first got up there, I thought it was an abandoned car. He checked the car and he says, oh no. And that's when we knew, he says it was it's the Emery's car. Most anyone in Rhode Island would have recognized the name Emery. That very day, Adam Emery had been convicted of murder. Though he was free on bail, Emery faced 20 years to life in a state penitentiary. Now it appeared that Adam and his wife Elena had found a way out of their impending separation by jumping to their deaths off the Newport Bridge. The apparent double suicide of Adam and Elena Emery was stunning news. But it would not be the last chapter in this extraordinary case. Far from it. Soon authorities would begin to suspect that the Emerys were in fact alive. The abandoned car just the final flourish in a well-planned dash for freedom. Even as we filmed our story, dramatic new evidence continued to surface. This most unusual of cases was set in motion by a single chance event. Have a good night. Great, thanks. You too. Thank you. On August 31st, 1990, Adam Emery, his wife Elena, and another couple stopped for dinner at a seafood stand in their hometown, Warwick, Rhode Island. It was just before 9 p.m. That's hungry. This is the best chowder in the island. Hey, that guy, she, he's taking off. The car sped away and disappeared around a corner. Adam Emery uh, turned on his car and he headed out and he looked off into the distance and he saw a car um, way off in the distance and his wife yelled out, uh, that's the car, let's chase them. Give the license plates. Yeah, 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 give me a pen, give me a pen. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Here. The car fixed in Emery's headlights was driven by a 20-year-old named Jason Bass. His cousin and a friend were with him. Cut him off, honey! Hey! You're gonna kill us! You're gonna pay for this! Just go! Just go! 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 This guy's crazy! Pull over! who this person is, you know. He got out of his car, yelling, screaming, that I'm gonna kick your butt, I'm gonna kill you. Um, major fight in words. Unbelievably, this guy was so mad. I mean, I've never seen anybody madder than this. I told you to pull over. I told you to, hey, stop the car. While clinging to the car, Adam began to slash at Jason with a knife. Jason, take him off! Look out for the ball! Help! Police! Somebody get help! Josh! Neighbors rushed out to help. They would soon be joined by an off-duty detective who lived just down the street. When I arrived, the, the whole air about the scene was very uh, spooky. It had a, a haze, and it was a warm summer night, and it just had a, a spooky, eerie uh, feeling about what I was going into. And I pulled up thinking that it was just a motor vehicle accident. It was far more than an accident. Jason Bass, stabbed once through the heart, died at the scene. I don't understand why my son got murdered when he was so good of a child that we'd help anybody. He just went and picked up a friend from work to take him home, and he ended up dead. 
The tragedy of Jason's death was compounded by the facts that soon emerged. He had never so much as touched Adam Emery's car. The Ford LTD that was being driven by Jason Bass was not the vehicle that hit Adam Emery's car at the uh, claim stand. They took paint chips off of Adam's car and they tested those paint chips with the, the, with the uh, paint of Jason Bass's car and proved conclusively that it was a different vehicle that struck uh, Adam Emery's car on that evening. Those who knew Adam Emery were stunned by the turn of events. He had never been in trouble with the law. Indeed, Emery had once been a military policeman in the Rhode Island National Guard. Now Adam Emery stood accused of murder in the second degree. His trial began on November 5th, 1993. Any idea what you have done to that family? I had to defend myself. I mean, this person was trying to take control of the situation, and I had to take some action. I had to do something. So, Adam Emery's testimony was knife. very rigid. It seemed rehearsed. And I think the jurors picked up on that. He never expressed any remorse for killing someone. He said that he stabbed Jason Bass in self-defense. He had no choice. The trial ended on November 10th. Adam Emery's 31st birthday. The members of the jury find the defendant, Adam Emery, guilty of murder in the second degree. Right after he was convicted, Alina Emery kind of muttered to herself, it's my fault. And then she got very tense and sort of clenched her jaw and said, I'm going to kill someone. I'm going to kill someone. The a courtroom exploded into uh, a time bomb of emotion. Uh, you had the Bass family there, who the person who murdered their son was convicted. You had a very close family on the Adam side and on Elena's side, who now their son is going to jail for 20 to life. And there was crying and emotion and anger, and there was a great mix of emotion in that courtroom on that day. Just moments after the verdict, a news crew caught this scene inside the courtroom. Elaine was pretty emotional, I guess, because of the verdict. Adam, Adam didn't have any emotions at all. You know, he, you know, it's like he didn't care one way or the other. You know, uh, in my mind, I think that uh, Adam knew he wasn't going to serve any time at all. By nightfall, Adam and Elena would be dead, or so it seemed, until police began to reconstruct the events leading up to the apparent double suicide. Adam Emery was allowed to remain free on bail pending formal sentencing one month later. He and Elena left the courthouse at about 3 p.m. 3.35, the Emerys showed up in a local sporting goods store. Uh, excuse me, um, do you have any more ab weights? Sure, let me just check for you. Okay. Elena was far from nervous. She smiled, uh, she was talkative. Um, it didn't seem like there was anything on her mind or she had anything planned. And I'll take four. Okay, four pair of these? The Emery's bought sweatsuits, athletic socks, and 80 pounds of strap-on exercise weights. But curiously, the salesman reported that Adam was disturbed by the total bill. To police, saving money seemed an unlikely concern for someone about to take his own life. At 4.45 p.m., Adam and Elena pulled up at the Newport Bridge. The previous hour, they had been observed calmly dining at a fast food restaurant, which also seemed out of character for a couple bent on suicide. 4.50 p.m., the Emerys were seen outside their car on the walkway of the bridge. By 5.15, Adam and Elena had driven away. What do you got? Abandoned car, nobody in it. 
Nobody around. Apparently, the Emery's returned to the bridge. Their car was reported as abandoned 6.53 p.m. The search for the bodies of Adam and Elena Emery was one of the most extensive in the history of Rhode Island. Sonar-equipped boats probed the bottom of the bay. Teams of divers searched the bridge footings and trained dogs scoured miles of shoreline. In the end, not a single scrap of evidence was recovered from the bay. The investigation stalled until Detective Hopkins remembered the courtroom footage and had an inspiration. I obtained that tape and I took it to a, uh, a person who was hearing impaired. Uh, one of her means of communication is to read uh, people's lips and asked her if she could interpret the conversation that was being held between Adam and Elena Emery. Said you promised me. Excellent. Said you promised me? Okay. Go back. Hours of reviewing and replaying the tape finally time. yielded Elena's furtive words. We're going to do what we originally said you promised me. You're, po you're positive. We're going to do what you originally said you promised me. We originally we. said. In the yeah. end, the okay. cryptic exchange left investigators about question. where they started. She says one, Clearly, she says the one Emerys one. had made a plan. But was it a desperate suicide pact or a bold scheme to run from the law? We should have done this before. Nine months after the Emerys disappeared, a fisherman working the Narragansett Bay found two human leg bones snagged in his net. I did a complete analysis. Clinging to one was a fragment of sock identical to those purchased by Adam and Elena. Microorganisms, plant life. I took the blue gold and blue bands to a marine biologist in an attempt to get a time frame as to how long the bones were in the water. There's nothing there. It was the determination of the marine biologist that there was no microorganisms grown within the webbing of the material, which told me as the investigator that the bones with this material wrapped around them were not under the water for the period of nine months, and that because of that, they could not be Adam and Elena Emery. In addition, a forensic anthropologist judged with 85% certainty that the bone most likely was from a white male, no more than five feet, seven inches tall. Adam Emery was 6'1". When Unsolved Mysteries arrived in Rhode Island to film this story in August of 1994, there was considerable evidence suggesting Adam and Elena Emery had fled. However, their families firmly believed the young couple had jumped to their deaths. By the time we finished filming, the case had once again taken a totally surprising turn. On August 30th, Detective Hopkins responded to an urgent call from the harbor. Narragansett Bay had yielded up another grim piece of evidence. I'm here to announce today that the skull that was recovered August 30th, 1994, from the East Passage of Narragansett Bay has been positively identified as that of Elena DeRocco Emery. Elena Emery had at last been found, but to date there has been no trace of Adam. Perhaps his bones are deep in Narragansett Bay, or perhaps the day will come when Adam Emery turns up alive. If so, he would almost certainly face one final question. How did it come to pass that Elena, alone, jumped to her death? Officially, the case remains open. Reliable sources say there is reason to believe Adam Emery never committed suicide. Emery is six feet, one inch tall and weighs 195 pounds. He has black hair and blue eyes. Next, a search for a Texas man accused of murdering his girlfriend. Lockhart, Texas, Monday, December 27, 1993. Jack White arrived at his daughter's house filled with apprehension. Patricia White, a 38-year-old nurse, had not been seen or heard from in nearly 24 hours. Trish? Trish? Where are 
much. Everyone was concerned about Latricia because she just hadn't gone to work Monday. And she never, never fails to go to work. Or at least call. Trish? Trisha? Trish? It was kind of dark in the room. And and I just called her, and then, then I went over and felt her. I knew that, that she was dead. Latricia White had been shot six times in the head with a 22 caliber weapon. Her death stunned her friends and neighbors in Lockhart, where Latricia was known as a dedicated and caring nurse. In addition to the grieving community, Latricia left behind two children and a host of unanswered questions. From the outset, investigators were puzzled. Despite the violent nature of the crime, there were no signs of a struggle, and nothing in the house had been disturbed. Got some blood here. Looks like it's going into the kitchen area, Paul. Just as puzzling was a mysterious disappearance of Latricia's live-in boyfriend, a local trucker, Lee Walker Hagen Jr., nicknamed Dub. Also missing was Dub's nine-year-old son, Chance, who had been visiting for the Christmas holidays. The fact that her boyfriend, Dub Walker Hagen, could not be found led us to, to several different areas to investigate. Number one, uh, is he a suspect? Could he have committed this crime? The other one is, or is he a victim? Has he also been injured? Three days later, an unexpected discovery. Dub's pickup truck was found abandoned in Austin, Texas, approximately 30 miles from the crime scene. For it to be there and be locked up uh, is, is well known in the law enforcement community in the Austin area that this is a high crime area. And for that vehicle to be found there really surprised me. In the cab, investigators found Dub's hunting rifle, which had not been fired, his checkbook and his wallet. In back, a toolbox, spare tire, and Christmas gifts, some unopened, but all streaked with blood. Initially in the investigation, we felt that this blood could have come from our victim. That was later ruled out. Uh, the blood type was not the same as our victim, so we feel like that someone else was injured. Uh, not seriously, but someone else was injured. Could that someone else have been Dub or Chance? The question could not be answered. All of the blood tests were inconclusive. What happened to Dub Walker Hagen and his nine-year-old son, Chance? It is a mystery that has torn two families in a small Texas town apart. Dub and Latricia White had grown up together. Yet today, the police and Latricia's family believe that Dub murdered Latricia in a jealous rage. On the other hand, Dub's family and friends are convinced that Dub and Chance are also victims, that they met with foul play themselves. It's been going on 11 months now, and we haven't heard anything from him at all. And that tells me if, he, if we haven't heard from him, then he's got to be dead. He's not dead. I mean, uh, if someone had come in and killed the three of them, why take a 270-pound body out? and leave a much lighter one. I mean, this doesn't make any sense. I don't know who did it. I just know that he, that he couldn't, have, couldn't have done it and then just disappeared off the face of the earth. To the police, however, Dub was the obvious suspect, especially after they began to take a close look at his relationship with Latricia. Hi, guys. Hi, Trish. Where were you last night? At the time of the murder, Dub and Latricia had been living together for six months. According to Latricia's family, Dub was extremely jealous and suspicious. Oh, it was more like 45 minutes. I wish that in the future, if you're going to be late, would you please give me a call and let me know, or try to be home on time. Trish and him always fought. They could fight about a fly on the wall. It didn't mean anything. I don't know if they just like to fight and then make up or whatever. But 
A fight doesn't mean anything to me. I mean, as far as them arguing, because I know he, he's not violent as far as, you know, like hitting and stuff like that. I lived with him. Dub's ex-wife, Chance's mother, disagrees. And I saw that he was a good man when I met him, and when I left him, I was scared to death of him. He had a temper. He treated my oldest boy terribly, and I was scared. Two days before Christmas, three days before the murder, a friend witnessed one of Dub and Latricia's more heated arguments. He's only nine years old. What do you expect? I expect him to be able to. Dub's son, Chance, was apparently the focus of the conflict. I don't know why you're making such a damn big deal out of it anyway. Excuse me, Chance. It's not your fault. Your father raised you to be a spoiled brat. Brat? He's my son, he's not yours, and you have no right. Do you understand me? Well, it's my house. Fine, we're out of here. Chance, get your stuff together, let's go. According to the friend, Dub packed his bags and threatened to leave. I'm tired of your breath. You don't have the guts to leave. However, just three nights later, Dub, Chance, and Latricia were seen enjoying themselves at a local restaurant. The incident was apparently forgotten. But late the next day, Latricia's father found her shot to death in her bedroom. Dub and Chance had disappeared. Three days later, Dub was formally charged with first degree murder. However, his family believes that the authorities have made a terrible mistake. He wasn't that kind of man. He just wasn't, it wasn't in him. He'd run up on a wreck or anything else, and you'd see blood, he'd go to pieces. He couldn't stand blood. He couldn't shoot nobody six times. No way. I believe that someone else killed Trish, and the reason they didn't kill Deb there on the scene was to make it look like that Deb had done it. All this time, they've been looking for Dub and Dub only. The, the law has. They've never looked for anybody else, so whoever did do it has, has gotten away with it so far. And under normal circumstances, Dub was an easygoing, very likable person. But if he was pushed to the point and enraged and made mad enough and we feel that probably chance was the trigger, chance was the, was the pivot point, that this set him off and he did something in this, it committed this act, that had he been given five minutes to stop and back off and think about it, he probably would not have done it. Four months passed with no sign of dub or chance. Then, at the house of Chance's maternal grandfather. Hello. 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 All he said was, help me. And then the phone was jerked out of his hand and slammed down. And uh, I looked over at my wife and I said, that was Chance. Could the plea for help have come from Chance Walker Hagen? Dub's family is convinced the answer is no. They believe the phone call was a hoax and that Dub and Chance were murdered. Latricia's family dismisses that scenario. They believe that Dub is a killer and still very much alive. I feel someone in his family is helping him because I just don't think a person can just disappear and not get help from somewhere to make help you survive and to get to where you need to go without being caught. I haven't heard from him, haven't given him any money, haven't done nothing. And there's no way that him, Dub, and that boy, Chance, can survive without money. They just want to believe that we know where they are and that we're helping them because that way they know that Chance and Dub were alive. But they can't be alive because we would have heard. Lee Dub Walker Hagen is 40 years old, six feet four inches tall, and weighs 240 pounds. He has blue eyes and blonde hair. Investigators believe that he could be practically anywhere because of his connections in the trucking industry. 
Chance Walker Hagen is 10 years old and weighs approximately 64 pounds. He has blue eyes, blonde hair, and a fair complexion. I want to find out what happened to him. I want to know one way or the other, and I want everyone else to know, because none of us, none of the families, can have any kind of peace whatsoever. You know, the whites have lost their daughter, and Gay's lost her son, and we've lost two people. And I think that we all need to know what really happened to them. Next, see how your tips led to the capture of a dangerous fugitive. On August 19, 1992, 20-year-old Travis Wade Duncan staged a brazen daylight raid on the Seminole County Jail in Oklahoma. He fled the scene with two inmates, John Fisher and Timothy Johnson. Duncan himself had been an inmate at the jail until just the day before. With Duncan behind the wheel, the three fugitives led authorities on a reckless high-speed chase through central Oklahoma, a running gun battle that lasted more than an hour. Every time he'd lean out and try to draw a bead on my unit, then I would go to the left or the driver's side and pick it, get as far over as I could, get out of the line of fire. This is something that you expect to see on the movies, but uh, you don't really expect it to happen to you. By 7.30 p.m., the three fugitives had rampaged along a 150-mile stretch of Interstate 40 at speeds of up to 100 miles per hour. But nothing slowed the pursuit, not even a homemade bomb. That Molotov cocktail failed to ignite because it hit the road. The wind, the high speed, blew the wick out of it and doing a smoldering. The chase finally ended on the shores of Kerr Lake. After a brief firefight, Fisher, Duncan, and Johnson fled into the woods. Unwittingly, they had trapped themselves on a peninsula jutting into the lake. Within an hour, Fisher and Johnson were cornered and taken into custody. But Travis Duncan had somehow managed to elude the dragnet. For more than 20 months, his whereabouts remained a mystery. Update. On May 5, 1994, Travis Wade Duncan finally came home to Seminole County, Oklahoma, five days after he was arrested in Boise, Idaho. Thanks to a tip from an alert viewer, Duncan's life on the run is finally over. We believe that he went from Oklahoma to North or South Carolina, has went into Washington and Oregon, uh, went to Hawaii, uh, was in Arizona prior to being arrested in Boise, Idaho. So he had traveled around doing odd jobs, living from one state to another. Once in custody, Duncan willingly revealed the details of his escape from Kerr Lake. Travis told me that after the crash, he stayed in the woods, traveled through the woods until he came to the edge of the water on Kerr Lake. He stayed hid in the bushes until about an hour after dark, and then he swam a cove, which would be approximately a half mile wide, and then came up and stayed in the tree line and walked a mountain line out, and he was able to catch a ride and go east from that area. I'm delighted that he's behind bars. That kind of ends this story and I'm completely satisfied with the results that nobody was injured, he was apprehended, and he's facing the years in the penitentiary that he's looking at.
Next week, join me for a special presentation, Mysteries of the Afterlife. On a stormy evening in 1975, Daniel Brinkley was struck by a powerful bolt of lightning. Daniel says he embarked on a remarkable near-death experience, which apparently left him with psychic powers. Just days before her wedding, 21-year-old Karen Walker passed away after a long, painful battle with cancer. Karen's mother claims that ever since, Karen has communicated with her, imparting valuable lessons on living from beyond the grave. And the chilling tale of a young girl's encounter with the dead, Heidi Weirich's parents were stunned to learn that her imaginary playmates might in fact be the restless spirits of real people who have passed to the other side. Join me next Friday as we explore the mysteries of the afterlife. Thank you.